Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you, my Father. I thank you for this lesson, Father. I thank you. The time that we are in, what an amazing time to be in, and in this time that we find ourselves in as we are in preparation for many things into new seasons, new seasons that are in the horizon. And when we understand how the enemy is coming in like a flood and truly wanting to bring destruction in so many ways, that you will raise a standard against him. You raise the standard against him. And you are the one that sees us through. And Father, even in this teachings, as we embark on this journey with Joseph, we understand that we can look on the one side, just as we can look at Yahushua's life, and we can say the enemy was trying to destroy him. And the enemy thought that he had won in the end. Only to be able to come to a place of understanding that <laughs> you were on your throne all along and you planned and had a purpose and a plan through everything. And so many times, Abba Yahuwah, in our own lives, we go through things that really do not make sense and we do not understand because these are things that we will go through thinking that it is the enemy and we fight the enemy and we fight the enemy only to not understand that your hand is upon the situation. And I'm sure young Joseph could have been one of those to have thought, what did I do to deserve this? And so many times we can stand in a position of thinking, what have I done to deserve this? Just as our Messiah came to the Garden of Gethsemane, the place where he has had to humble himself, a place where he prayed three times and asked his father to remove the cup from him. Yet he was able to say, not my will, but your will be done. And so Abba Yahuwah, I thank you that you will help us to be able to, in the times ahead, be able to be those that will be able to have such discernment that we can have discernment of the understanding of that which is your will and that which is of the enemy. Because the enemy can come and bring destruction. But if we do not discern, we can be opposing your will and your way in our lives through our own prayer. And so I praise and I thank you, Abba Father, that you alone hold us in the palm of your hand, just as you did Joseph. And I thank you that you had a purpose and a plan for Joseph. And if Joseph didn't go into that pit, if Joseph wasn't sold into slavery, who was going to be the deliverer of the world in a time of great famine? And so, Father, you are raising up many in this hour and this time to raise up like Joseph's. And they have been in training for a long time. But in the end, it's because you have your hand upon them in order to be able to thrust them forth in these last days to raise up as a Joseph did. And even though many things in their lives have not made sense, but it's because you alone are on your throne. And so, Father, I thank you. I thank you for the many lessons that you are going to teach us throughout the story of Joseph and the similarities and the lining up of Joseph and our Messiah. And so I praise and I thank you, Abba Yahuwah, for that which you are revealing to us in this time, the deeper revelation of your word so that we may have the understanding of everything has a foundation. And how sad when all we do is we read a New Testament 
and do not understand that the foundation is so important in order to build and where the scriptures come from already in the foundational covenant that we've been given. And so I thank you, Father, that tonight you will open up the mind of our understanding, that you will open up our ears, that you will open up our eyes, that you will open up our hearts to receive your word. I thank you, Father, that this will be seed that will fall on good soil. And truly, I pray, Abba, that it will produce a harvest for you. Because the harvest is ripe, but the workers are few. And we are praying for the workers of the harvest to be able to be raised up to bring in the harvest. And so I thank you, Father, that you are doing a deep work in each one of us to be able to be the light that needs to be in this dark hour that we are finding ourselves in. And I thank you, Father, for your word that brings life, life in abundance. I praise and I thank you for this in Yahushua's name. Amen. Praise Abba. So last week we started our journey with Joseph. And we saw where Joseph has gone wrong. Can we say he went wrong? Or can we say that it's part of the Father's plan? And so we looked at this from two perspectives. Because everything can be seen in different ways. It's easy for us to always say, okay, this was a young, arrogant young man maybe. But on the other hand, he was a young man that was loved by his father. And could it be because he was a willing and obedient servant who was willing to sit in his father's tents and in his father's courts, just like Jacob did? And he was not interested in being a hunter like his brother, but that instead he wanted to sit and dwell in the, in the tents of his father. To hear from his father, tell me a little bit more about our creator. Tell me a little bit more about your dream that you had. Tell me a little bit more about that dream that you had when you were with my uncle Laban, tell me a little bit more about this. Could it be a young man that was really desiring to know more about this creator? And yet, at the end of the day, as our story continues, he must have been this kind of young man that was sitting, knowing the difference between what's right from what's wrong. And it shows you that his brothers were not doing that because with the decisions that the brothers were making and the decisions that Joseph is going to make. And then we will see who was truly listening and learning the ways of the father and who was not. Who was listening to the instructions of that was given already from Abraham Isaac and Jacob, those instructions and rules and ways of having to serve the Father. And so we see that verse 3, Joseph loved and Israel loved Joseph more than his children because he was the son of his old age. And saw that their father loved him more and their bro- and his brothers saw that their father loved him more than all his brothers. They hated him and were not able to speak peaceably to him. So understand already that there is a problem because the brother Joseph in verse 2 brings an evil report to his father about his brothers, tattletailing, telling the father, Look, my brothers did this and they did this. Not always a good thing to do. Not a good thing to be able to speak about someone else at the end of the day to bring an evil report because an evil report brings destruction. And now, because of this, there is now 
hatred towards their brother. So you see, you know, the brother does something to them, like brought an evil report, tattletailing on him, and now they get upset with him. And it starts with offense. You see, they got offended. They'll get offended with him. And once they get offended with him, then eventually they hate him. And when people get offended, it's a big problem. And it can bring a lot of issues in our hearts that need to be made right. And you see, they were not able to speak peaceably to him. Why were they not able to speak peaceably to him? Because there's uh, issues. They, they, they hate him now. And then Joseph goes and he dreams a dream and he tells it to his brother so that they hated him even more. And so we must understand. Could it have been that Joseph could have taken a bit of time to maybe discuss the dream with his brothers, maybe when they're a little bit more peaceable with him? But you see, this is always what happens. Many times in the prophetic, there will be a prophetic person, a prophet that will raise up and speak. And not always is someone going to want to accept what they have to say, which makes it very difficult. Because Joseph is speaking the dream. Now there's some times that we have to learn when to share something and when to be quiet. And this is what's very important because at the end of the day, we need to be able to wait on the Father for the appointed time because everything has its timing and a word released at the wrong timing can maybe be destructive. It's the right word but not the right timing. And so everything needs to be in its appointed time. And we have to wait on the Father to release what he wants to do at its appointed time. And so Joseph dreamed a dream, and because of this now, the brothers are going to hate him even more. And he said to them, please listen to this dream which I have dreamt. See, we were binding sheaves in the midst of the field, and see, my sheaf rose up and also stood up, and see, your sheaves stood up all around and bow down to to the to my sheaf now i mean understand something this is a bunch of men that already do not like him this is a bunch of men that already have a problem with him and now he's going to tell them that they are going to bow down to him this isn't going down very well and so that's why i say at the end of the day, we can also look and see that maybe Joseph did not share this. He should have maybe kept quiet and kept it to himself. But yet, if he had not shared it, then they would not have known at a later stage if Joseph would have kept it to himself. They would not have known at the later stage the dreams that Joseph was having. And so we must understand that in everything, doesn't matter how things go, Father works things together for good for those that love him. And yes, sometimes there are those prophets that are arrogant, young prophets, arrogant, filled with pride. And it's not to say that the word is still not from the Father. The word is still from the Father. And maybe there was a little bit of an attitude with Joseph. But you see, Father has a way of being able to sort out that attitude. Because I can tell you one thing. <laughs> when it comes to the prophets, Father knows how to deal with his prophets himself. He knows how to be able to humble them and bring them down. Many times people think that they need to do the work. But believe me when I say to you, Father knows how to deal with his prophets. And so we had a look at scriptures like Matthew 5 verses 44 that says, Bless those who curse you and do good to those who hate you. So at the end of the day, even though his brothers were hating him, 
he still was going to bless them because look, you're going to see that he's now going to go take them food. And we saw in Matthew 5, 21 to 22, that we're not to be angry or hate our brother in our heart. And we had a look at the whole story of, we started by having to look at Genesis in the beginning of everything that happened with the story of Cain and Abel. We had a look at that because what happened? Cain got angry with his brother because the father accepted Abel's offering but did not accept Cain. But what did he say to him? If you were to do what is right, would I also not accept yours? Sin is knocking at your door and you have the authority to master over him. So, Cain was given the opportunity to have to master over that sin. Yet, he chose to be offended by what happened and carried that offense in his heart. And that offense eventually, if not dealt with, it goes deeper into a root and it brings anger and eventually it brings hatred that will bring murder. And this is what we must understand. Then we had a look at 1 John 2 verses 8 to 11. The one who says he is in the light but hates his brother is in darkness. So we cannot say that we are in the light when we hate our brother in our heart. 1 John 3 verses 14 to 15. If we hate our brother we are a murderer. So there we go. What did Cain do? He hated his brother and he murdered him. And sometimes because of things in our own hearts, we will murder the people with our mouths. 1 John 4 verses 19 to 21. If we say that we love Abba, we must love our brother. And in Genesis, we continue now. We continue with the story where eventually Joseph has another dream and then he dreams that the sun, the moon and the 11 stars bow down to him and he related it to his father and his brothers and his brothers rebuked him and said to him, what is this dream that you have dreamt? Shall we, your mother and I, your brothers, indeed come to bow down to the earth before you? And his brothers envied him. So you see, the envying him is many times the jealousy. So we must understand. We become jealous. What did Cain do? He became jealous. And then he gets offended. And then he gets angry. And then he gets the hatred and then murders his brother. So there we saw he, they envied him. They envied him. Why? Why is he getting a dream and we're not getting a dream? And the envy is the jealousy that eventually gets them to hate him even more. So you see, when we rise up against a brother or a sister, we have to always look within our hearts. What is there? Is there a jealousy? Is there an, uh, an offense? Is there a hatred? Is there an anger? What is there? And so they envied him. Understand, Joseph, because he has spent times in the court with his father, in the tent of his father, spent time in the tent, the same as what Jacob was spending time in the tent with Isaac, learning the ways of Abba Yahuwah. Joseph has spent time with his father Jacob, learning the ways of Abba Yahuwah. And the same anointing that was upon Jacob is being transferred onto Joseph as Jacob was a man that would dream dreams. He dreamt about the dream of the ladder. He dreamt about the dream of Laban, Laban showing him what to do with the animals, how to be able to go about this. He had a dream. And so at the end of the day, we must understand we must understand that these things are very much there in order to be able to bring us to a place of 
There's an anointing of a transferal of an anointing that has taken place. And this is the transferal of the anointing that has come upon Joseph because he was the son of his father's old age. But yet, was it only because Joseph was the favorite? He was the favorite, but what made him become the favorite? And we had a look at last week and we discussed, we are not to have favorites within our children because favoritism brings jealousies which births destruction. So we pick up on the story again and it says, and the brothers envied him, but his father guarded the word and his brothers went to feed their father's flock. So you see, his brothers envied him, but his father guarded the word. So you see, his father didn't, even though his father spoke up against him, even though his father was speaking up against him, but understand something. His father spoke up against him, but guarded the word in his heart. Yet his brother's different attitude, they envied him. And his brothers went to feed their father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I send you to them. So he said to him, here I am. And he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the sheep and bring back word to me. So he went, so he sent him out of the valley to Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now you see, do you see, does Joseph have an attitude towards his brothers? Joseph could have had an attitude towards his brothers and said, no, am I my brother's keeper? Am I my brother's keeper? That is exactly what happened, what Cain said to the father when the father said, where is your brother? Am I my brother's keeper? But you see, there's no malice in Joseph's heart. And a certain man found him and see he was wandering in the field. And the man asked him, saying, what do you seek? And he said, I'm seeking my brothers. Please inform me where they are feeding their sheep. And the man said, they have left here. For I heard them say, let us go towards Dothan. So Joseph, Yosef, went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. Dothan just means two walls, two wells. It's the place of the two wells. And they saw him from a distance. And before he came near them, they plotted against him to kill him. Okay. So what do we see here? Is this not the same kind of thing that we see with Joshua? Were they not plotting and planning to kill him? Were the Sadducees and the Pharisees not together wanting to plot and plan to kill, to kill him? And this is what we must understand that at the end of the day, we are going to see tonight, we are going to see all the resemblances. We're going to see the resemblances that is going to take place between Yoshua and between Joseph. Because it's a type of shadow of Joseph is the suffering servant. Remember, Joseph is the suffering servant and Yoshua first came as a suffering servant before he had to become in the line of David to be the conquering king. So everybody was looking for a conquering king because he was coming in the line of David, but he first came like Joseph, a suffering servant. And so we must understand that there's two sides of a coin. One side, yes, he is the line of the tribe of Judah, but on the other side, he came as the lamb, ready to be able to be slaughtered at a slaughter, to be laid on an altar for the slaughter and this is what happens when people gather together they can come into little groups and you see they saw him in a distance and what did they do they started speaking up against him and decided to kill him because of the hatred within them so we've got to be very careful when we carry something in our heart because then when we are in a place what do we do Will we murder that person with our own way of planning, planning and plotting, plotting 
to kill that person? We must understand something. We might not be able to commit the sin of physical murder, but that is why the Father is very, very stern on the fact that we've got to be so careful what we speak. And they said to each other, see, this, matter, this master of dreams is coming. So you see, now they make fun of him because now they're putting him down. And, and now then, come and let us now kill him and throw him into, this, into some pit and shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. Let us then see what comes of his dreams. Now I ask you. Now if these young men that have been brought up in the ways of Abba Yahuwah, that has been learning the ways of the Father, how could they, they would know, thou shalt not kill. Yet, how bad is the hatred in their hearts that they have no problem in killing. Do you understand? Do you understand why the Father says that we need to be able to guard our hearts? Because what are the issues? So even though they might be sitting down, maybe learning with their Father, learning the commands, because remember to Abraham already it was given his, the Torah, the statutes, the ordinances, his laws, his statutes, his ordinances, it was given already to to Abraham, so if it was given to Abraham, it was passed down to Isaac. If it was given to Isaac, it was passed down to Jacob. If it was given to Jacob, it was being passed down to these 12 tribes, to his 12 sons. But now, they are planning to kill their own brother because of jealousy, because of, of, of um, the fact that they, they have an offense in their heart because of what is residing within them, because of the fact that there is tremendous envy and jealousy and hatred and all of these things that's dwelling within them, instead of them laying their hearts before the Father. But Reuben heard and rescued him from their hands and said, let us not strike his being. Interesting. Reuben being the older brother. Reuben meaning, his name meaning behold a son. So this, this Reuben that's behold a son is the one going to rescue Joseph that is going to become the one that eventually is going to be the one that is going to deliver them in the end. And him being the eldest, obviously showing a little bit more wisdom here. You see, maturity eventually brings wisdom. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood. You see, shed no blood. So they should know, you shall not kill. Do not shed blood. Nothing good is going to come out of us having to kill our brother. Shed no blood. Throw him into the pit which is in the wilderness and do not lay a hand on him in order to rescue him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So now imagine Yahweh's righteous Reuben. You know, he's sitting and he's saying, you know, let, us, let, me, let, let them rescue him, not to kill him. If they put him in this pit, We'll all leave, leave him in the pit. I will then at a later stage come and rescue him out of that pit <coughs> and bring him back to my father. So do you understand? There is one that is trying to stand on behalf of Joseph. There is one that has not, that even though he himself maybe has a few things within his heart, but yet he doesn't want to see blood being shed. But you see, when there's more, against one it becomes a problem that's why when it was in the wilderness we had two bringing a good report ten of the the spies so there was the twelve spies that went out two brought a favorable report ten brought an evil report and which way did they go when the majority rule 
that's the way that people want to go. But you must understand, it's not always the right way. Here there was one standing on behalf of Joseph. And so it came to be when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his robe, the long robe which was on him. Okay. Now we must understand, Joseph received a colored cloak. What was this cloak, this robe that he received from his father? You see, this was already a prophetic reflection of the fact that Joseph received this cloak, this coat that was a mantle that his father was giving him. So his father was already operating in a prophetic way, giving this, this son of his a mantle, and this is why the mantle of his father was being passed on to him in terms of the fact that he received that prophetic anointing that was on Jacob of being able to see dreams. And now you must understand, this mantle that was an earthly thing that he received, because it was an earthly cloak that brought jealousy upon the brothers, is being stripped from him. And so the authority and the favor that uh, the authority that his father had already prophetically given him, the mantle of authority that he was going to walk in, but he was going to have to be stripped of his earthly authority and thrown into a pit. You see, that is what the father does. You see, when a prophet is raising up, there's many, many things. There can be mantles being put on this prophet. But if the prophet is not ready, the father brings, there has to be a stripping. So you must understand. A pit, to me, represents a prophet in training. It's a prophet in training. It's the pit. And why? Because at the end of the day, he's now... The cloak that he's received, he's going to have to be stripped of everything of the world. And where he was raising himself up in the world to be able to get to the place of where he's now going to be stripped and to receive an authority that was only going to be given not by his earthly father, but by his heavenly father. Because Abba Yahuwah is going to put his authority on him. So you see, that which was given to him on a earthly manner through his father that created nothing but jealousy was going to have to be stripped from him. His father was in the prophetic sense walking prophetically by doing this act. But yet at the end of the day, the father needed to strip him from that so that he would be able to receive the authority that was only going to come from Abba Yahuwah. Now with Messiah, understand Messiah had the heavenly authority. Messiah was walking in the heavenly authority, but he had to strip himself of that authority where he was seated at the right hand of the Father to be able to strip himself and come to the earth and be a man. To be able to take all that off him, of all the glory and everything that he walked in in the heavenly realm, he was going to have to be stripped of everything in that heavenly realm to be able to come and walk on the earth in the authority that was going to be given to him from his father, but so that he would have authority on the earth. Because remember, if he comes from the earth, he has authority on the earth. If he would have stayed in the heavens, he did not come from the earth, so he could not give his authority to earthly beings. But because he came from the earth, remember, who was given the authority to, 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 to subdue the earth? Man was given the authority to subdue the earth. And who lost it? Man lost the authority to subdue the earth because they listened to the serpent in the Garden of Eden and therefore were thrown out. Now Yeshua had to come be born through a woman, come through the birth canal, be born from the earth 
to be able to give man now the authority to rule on the earth once again with him. And so here is a shadow of what we see happening here. As Joseph is being stripped of his cloak that was made up of many colors, this, this covenant that is there, the authority that was there in the, in the prophetic walk that he's going to have to walk in is being stripped because he's been humbled. And that is why every prophet, before he raise, is to be raised up, he needs to be stripped of everything. He needs to be humbled so that everything he does is not for showmanship, not to be seen, not to be heard, not to be known. He doesn't need to be seen by anybody. He doesn't need to be heard by anybody. He doesn't need to be known by anybody. He just needs to be seen, heard, and known by his father alone. And when the father takes him through the process or takes her through the process of that stripping and he goes through the difficult trials and difficulties that he's got to go through, it's that stripping place so that when the father finally raises the prophet up again, it's not about showmanship. It's about being able to do the work of the father because they have lost everything already just to be able to serve the father. And so we must understand Yeshua also came to be stripped of everything. He had to come as the lamb, the suffering servant, to be stripped of everything, to die, to surrender, to then receive the kingly authority to reign and to rule. And so Joseph was going to also be stripped of everything to eventually come at the end to be able to rule and reign in the authority that was going to be given to him, not by man, but by Abba Yahuwah. And so we continue to read our story. And they sat down and to eat a meal, and they lifted their eyes and looked and saw a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead, with their camels bearing spices and balm and myrrh, going to take them down to Mitzrayim. And now Yehuda, interesting, now Yehuda comes into the scene. And now Yehuda says to his brothers, what would we gain if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? So you see, we'll kill our brother and then we'll conceal it. We'll cover it up. They've already made a perfect plan. We'll just say he's been eaten by some animal and, you know, yeah, we've found his cloak and yet we've got rid of him once and for all. Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother, our flesh and his brothers listened. So again, here is another brother, Yehuda, who's now going to have to raise up two. He's also going to have to raise up. He's also going to have to stand for his brother, but he's the one who sells him out. So at the end of the day, who was Yahushua sold out by? You know, we call him Judas Iscariot, but if you read the Bible in a, another translation, and if you read the Hebrew translation of the name Judah, Judas, it's the name Yehuda. So Messiah Yahushua is going to be sold out by Yehuda. And he's going to be sold out by his own, by his own family, by his own people, by his own tribe, by his own family members. He is going to be sold out. And so we must understand that everything of the picture that we see unfolding over here is everything of the picture of the understanding of our Messiah because Messiah gets sold out. Judas Iscariot, who is Yehuda, sells him out, betrays him. He's betray he betrays him and sells him out. And so we look 
and we see that he's being sold out to is being sold out to who to the Ishma, to the Mitzray. So it says, and the men of Midian traders passed by, so they pulled Joseph up and lifted him out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for twenty pieces of silver, and they took Joseph to Mitzrayim. Interesting. Who was also sold for pieces of silver? Joseph was sold for 20 pieces of silver. Yahushua was sold for 30 pieces of silver. And so, where do we see in the word, and this is something that we must understand, he now gets sold even to the Yishmaelites. Now, who are the Yishmaelites? The Yishmaelites are his half-brothers because Ishmael was also the son of Abraham. And now he's being sold out to who? He's being sold out to the Ishmaelites. So now the Ishmaelites, he's not only just being sold out by Judah, but he's going to be sold out even by his half-brother. So at the end of the day, his family, all his family, are going to turn against him. Those that are also part of the house by being the half-brother Ishmael. Remember Ishmael, the Ishmaelites are who? They are the ones that come from who? From the sons of Ishmael that were also from Abraham's children. So Messiah Yeshua has come to redeem all and it's his own that are going to turn against him. And that's why if you look at Matthew chapter 21, let's go to Matthew chapter 21. Oh, sorry, not Matthew 21. Matthew chapter 10, verse 21. In Matthew chapter 10, verse 21 says, And a brother shall deliver up brother to death, and a father his child. And children shall rise up against parents and shall put them to death. So yeah, we already see, is there anything new under the sun that's going to come in the renewed covenant? Nothing is new in the renewed covenant because Yahushua is a, is a walking testimony of what has already happened with Yosef. And that is why he's saying, a brother shall deliver up a brother to death. So do you think you're going to have peace with those of your own family? Your own family turn against you. And so you will see family members, blood brothers and sisters will turn against you. Then family members in the church where you are brothers and sisters in the faith will turn against you. So it will be all these people that will call themselves your family. That will be the ones in the end that will turn against you. Because if they turned against Messiah, and if they allow, so you must understand, when those things come in your heart, if malice comes in your heart, if you're going to have that envy come in your heart, if you're going to have that, that um, it says, uh, in the last days, brother will turn against brother. Because why? Because they took offense and their hearts waxed cold because of offense. It's spoken of in Matthew chapter 24. So you see, why does a brother turn against a brother? A brother turns against a brother because of the malice of the offense, because of the jealousies, because of the envies that then birth hatred, that then birth murder. And these are the things that we need to guard for. These are the things that we must understand. These are the things that the enemy uses to be able to bring destruction because he wants to bring division. He wants to bring destruction. He wants to divide homes. He wants to destroy homes. Yet, Yoshua says he brings a sword and we're going to read it now. So we read again, 21, and brother shall deliver up brother. Is that not what happened? The one brother, is the, the lot of them are saying, let's kill him. The one brother's trying to come and say, protect him. No, don't, just put, throw him in the pit. But his heart was to save him. Now the other brother is saying, sell him out. Let's sell him out. Is that not what the 
what the is 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 that not what the Yehudim did with Messiah? They sold him out. They got Judas Iscariot to be able to find something on him to sell him out and to put him to death. His own. His own were the ones who came up against him. But who came up against him? The religious Pharisees and Sadducees. So I say to you today, the worst spirit that you will ever come up, up, up against. Let me tell you, it's not all this witchcraft. The worst kind of witchcraft is the witchcraft of the religious spirit. Because the religious spirit will kill you when it thinks it's right. Because what is the religious spirit? A religious spirit that drives a person is a spirit of pride. It puffs up and it thinks it's righteous in its own eyes. So now we look at Matthew chapter 10 verse 33. But whoever shall deny me before men, him I shall also deny before my Father who is in the heaven. So you see, so we carry on to read. It says, do not think I came to bring peace on the earth. I did not come to bring peace but a sword. Why? Because you see, in the two ho in the house, they will be two divided against each other because what divides them? Because one is standing for truth and the other one is standing with religious things. And the one that is religious and the one that is trying to walk in truth, like Joseph is trying to walk in the truth, yet his brothers are coming up against him. Joseph is speaking the truth. He says, you see, we must remember, the scripture says in Habakkuk chapter 2, this vision is yet for appointed time. Write the vision down. This vision is yet for an appointed time, but it shall surely come to pass. That's why his father put it in his heart. Because he put it in his heart. Because he says, if this is a vision that's coming from the father, or a dream that's coming from the father, it shall surely come to pass. But you see, we are so quick to be able to shrug people off and say, ah, look at this person, what they're on about. And where do they come from? We need to understand the true prophetic. We need to understand the true prophetic. The true prophetic is not there where a person is just going to be able to give people prophetic words. The true prophetic is one that brings correction, that brings encouragement, uplifting, but it corrects. If we look at the whole book of most of the prophets in the Bible, what were they doing? They were having to bring rebuke and correction. To say you have gone astray. You're no longer with the Father. You need to get back to the Father. You need to repent. I do not see prophets. You cannot be a prophet if you're not bringing people to repentance and back to the Father. That's the true prophetic. And the true prophetic will bring a rebuke. To say you have gone astray. That is what Jeremiah. Why did Jeremiah? Jeremiah just like just like Joseph, just like Yeshua, was in jail more than was out. Why? Because Jeremiah kept speaking up against the false prophets. Jeremiah kept coming up against the false prophets to say, you are going into exile. You are a bunch of people that think you have a covenant with the Father, but you do not. You are going into exile. And that is the word from the Father. But all the false prophets stood up and said, oh, this mad prophet, put him in jail. But yet he was the only one in the land speaking up against these false prophets. But you see, people preferred to listen to the prophets that were tickling the ears because they didn't want to hear a hard word. They didn't want to hear a word of correction. Jeremiah the whole time is telling them, even when they go to Jeremiah, I think it's when the father gave me this at the beginning of this year, and when they go to Jeremiah, I think it was in, in Jeremiah chapter 44, 45, 46, thereabout, and he's going, and they say, Jeremiah, please, we need a word from the father, and Jeremiah says to them, you are not to go to Egypt, you are to stay in Babylon, you are not to go to Egypt, they did not listen. And they went to Egypt and there they went and served the idols in Egypt. And they rebelled against Jeremiah. They said, no, 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 this is not the word that we want to hear. So you see, those who do not want to hear the word of the Father will always stand up against the prophet. Because this is the problem. 
is it really the word that the prophet is bringing that's the problem or is it the fact that their hearts are not right and this is what we must understand because Yeshua says I come to bring a sword I come to bring division he brought a sword he came to bring division a man against his father a daughter against her mother a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law and a man's enemies of those of his own household now do you think that this is new in the new testament no this comes from micah 7 verse 6 it already comes from micah this already comes from the books of the prophets where an en your enemy will be those of your own household he who loves father and mother more than me is not worthy of me and he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me and he who does not take up his stake and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who has, has found his life shall lose it. And he who has lost his life for my sake shall find it. So there we go. And so we must understand that this is exactly what is going on here. Joseph is being sold out because Joseph has spoken a dream. His dream is the truth. But his brothers don't really want to listen to this. Now he's being sold out for 20 pieces of silver. So I thought I would just go and look up what does the number 20 mean? Now isn't it interesting that if we really look at this, I mean this word is just amazing. I stand in awe how the Father brings the prophetic into everything. The number 20 means to be prepared and ready to enter into spiritual warfare. Oh my goodness, is this not what Joseph was about to come into? Because in Potiphar's house, he was going to have to be ready for spiritual warfare because spiritual warfare was going to come his way. And he had to prepare. Number 20 also means to prepare for trial, which means it refers to a desert experience or that you are entering a period of trial and testing tried and approved oh my goodness is this not everything that joseph is going to have to go through he has now been sold for the 20 pieces of silver and this is exactly what is going to be displayed in his life he's going to have to go through a desert experience he's going to go through a period of trial and testing and tried and approved and he's going to have to prepare himself for spiritual warfare and it's to assess and decide. So the number 20 is also the number that means assess and decide. It shows that you have to make a decision on a particular matter. And that you have to decide whether you will receive it or whether you will decide against it. Now isn't this exactly what Joseph has to go through? There's going to be something that's going to present himself to him. That he's going to have to decide. Do I fall for this? Do I go with this? Or do I stand against it? Because the decision is going to cost me something else on the other end. At least if I give in to this, it's going to be easier. I'm not going to have to go through this. And he's going to be confronted with the decision. So do you see, when we look at all these things, we understand. Now, where does he go? He's going to get sold and he's going to go into Mitzrayim. Yeshua also has those as Yeshua is born, Yeshua is born, and when he's still an infant, still a child, to, up to the age of two years old, he was two years old, when Joseph, his father, is, appears an angel to him to tell him that he's to flee to Egypt. Because now there's word that's come out that he's about, they have heard about the fact that the wise men have said that a king has raised up and the king that is raised up, <laughs> he's the king that is going to reign and rule over the Yehudim, the Jews. And so now, what does he do? He wants to have all the children killed in the land. And so now, uh, Yeshua needs to flee to Egypt in order to find asylum. What happens to Abraham when Abraham is got a famine going on in the land where does he flee to find safety and food egypt so there's a reason for egypt always coming into the picture so now 
Joseph is going to be sold into Mitzrayim, into Egypt. And Reuben returned to the pit and see Yosef was not in the pit and he tore his garments. So you see now, yeah, Reuben really wanted to be able to save his brother. But Joseph is no longer in the pit. Now there's something else that I... No, it's fine. Let me continue to read. And he returned to his brothers and said, The boy is gone. And I were... And I, where am I to go? So, I want you to understand, this is what I, I feel I do need to say it. Joseph is going to eventually paint the picture. He's going to have two sons. He's going to have Ephraim and Manasseh. So, one tribe is going to split into two tribes. Joseph is going to have two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And from Ephraim is eventually going to be representing the ten tribes, the lost tribes. Interesting. Judah is the one that wants to sell out Joseph and get rid of him. And you must understand, in the land today, that spirit is still there. All those that are truly of the lost tribes that are wanting to come back, that need to be able to take possession of their land, Judah those of the tribe of Judah do, are suppressing them and do not allow them to return back to the land. And instead, they are making their own tribes. But yet the true tribes of the lost tribes that are returning back to Father's ways, that are returning back to Father's word, that rightfully, that is the land of their inheritance, Judah is not allowing them to return. So he sells them out. And so they took Joseph's robe and slew a male goat and dipped the robe in blood and sent the long robe and brought it to their father and said, We found this. Please look, is it the robe of your son or not? And he recognized it and said, It is my son's robe. An evil beast has devoured him. Yosef is torn, torn to pieces. And Yaakov tore his garments and put sackcloth on his waist and mourned for his son many days. Now you see, tell me, what kind of malice in their hearts was there to, to think that Yari is an old man and yet they would allow their father to suffer? Where was the love for their own father? Do you see what this kind of attitudes in our hearts causes? It causes us to be able to have a callous and a hardness of a heart. And that is why the Father wants us to chisel all those, that callous heart to have a heart that is pliable in his hand. And all his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, now let me go down into Sheol. Sheol to my son in mourning. So his father wept for him. And the Midianites had sold him in Mitzrayim to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh and captain of the God. So next week we continue the story as we continue to unfold this beautiful presentation of walking in the footsteps of of Joseph as we unfold the footsteps of Messiah and see what is it that Joseph has to go through that is the similarities of what our Messiah has had to go through. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I just want to thank you for your word, my King. I thank you for your gift of Messiah Yahshua the one that came as a suffering servant. And so we all wanted a conquering king. And the Yehudim in that time wanted a conquering king. And that is why they couldn't accept him. Because he was supposed to come as the son of David. But what they didn't understand is that first he had to come 
as the suffering servant, the son of Joseph, the one that was going to be betrayed by his own brothers, the one that was going to be killed, not a physical death that Joseph went through, but in his father's heart to be able to tell his father that he was dead and for them to get rid of him once and for all. They wanted to rid themselves of him completely. And so the Yehudim were also wanting to get rid of Yeshua completely. That they even allowed Barabbas, a murderer, to go free, but instead crucify our Messiah. And so what a beautiful picture of us understanding how we too are going to be no different to Joseph. We are going to be no different to our Messiah because it's those of our own household that will always raise up against us if they have malice, envy, wickedness, jealousies, unforgiveness, hatred, all these things in their heart that they're not willing to deal with. And it just breeds more and more destruction. And so, Abba Yahuwah, I really pray that this be a true picture of us understanding to what degree, yeah, all these young men that know the right ways of the Father yet can act in such an evil way. And these are those that form the house of Israel. But then we also understand why, again, there is a split and why that house of Israel goes completely astray and how Yeshua has to come because it's only through the blood of the Lamb and through us receiving the Ruach of Yahuwah that we truly are able to put to death this flesh nature that is always wanting to raise itself up. Give us your authority and power, Abba Yahuwah, to be able to help us to overcome those fleshly things within us when we want to take offense, when we want to be able to get upset with someone because maybe someone said something or someone didn't live up to something or someone has said something maybe to offend us. Help us, Abba Yahuwah, to deal with those things in our heart because if we don't, if we are not quick to deal with those things in our heart, they, they bring a deep root and it becomes a, a tree and then the tree bears the fruit that comes from that bitter root. And so help us, Father, to be able to pull out the root of any bitter thing that might be there, but instead allow your blood to come and wash us clean so that we may be those that can truly be set free to be a light and not to walk in darkness. And so I thank you for all your revelation that you have shown. And I thank you, Father, for us to understand that we will be tested and tried, that we will be having to prepare ourselves for warfare, and that we have to understand that we will have to make decisions, either so to the flesh and be destroyed, or so to the Ruach, to the Spirit, and receive deliverance. And so I praise and I thank you for your word. May it bring much fruit in our lives. In Yeshua's name I pray this. Amen.